don't do it by yourself. Don't, don't feel the need to white knuckle. There's a time and place for willpower, but willpower is only one small component of it. At the end of the day, a community is going to get you through it. So find some folks that can help you with that. At that point, it kind of turns to, from an ordeal into an adventure. Welcome to the Juggling the Chaos of Recovery podcast, where we focus on health and wellness and overcoming all types of addictions. You're in the right place if you're a mom, dad, sibling, or caregiver who has a loved one who is or was struggling with an eating disorder or any other kind of addiction. In a time where everything seems heavy, I'm here to bring you a very real yet lighthearted take on what the heck we're all supposed to do with our lives while we care for our loved ones who are struggling. One thing holds true throughout it all. You can't juggle the chaos without smiling, at least a little bit. Well, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am your host, Moira Gorski. Love to uh, connect with others. If you've heard through many episodes, love to connect with others who are in this space of recovery, in the space of helping others on their recovery journey. And my guest today is Matt Gardner, who's joining me um, to talk about just all of that, his story of recovery and how he has moved into the space of helping others and um, mindfulness, a little sound therapy, just a little. Um, and I also love, you know, our conversations we've had before just about the benefit of rest, which is so good. So before we get any uh, farther along, uh, welcome, Matt. Uh, thanks for coming on my podcast today. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for the introduction. And thanks for having me. Very excited for this. Yeah, we had a, a great conversation, I want to say last week. And yeah, there's a lot uh, that resonates with your story and my story that, you know, different connection points, albeit for different reasons, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, great opportunity to come on and, and thank you for having me. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Glad to do that. And uh, again, glad to share your story. And again, I think most importantly, as we share people's stories, as we talked about, you know, we share that the story of hope that people aren't alone in their world of struggle, if you will. Um, and that there are different ways that we can take care of ourselves, tools that we can put on our tool belt to help us, um, again, show up good for ourselves, good for what we're doing in the world every day. So let's start as we uh, we do with these, is start with your story, share what you would are comfortable sharing in regards to your story and your story to sobriety and um you know, kind of things you learned along the way, but we'll kind of start, we'll start there. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Thanks for the opportunity. So I'll hit the highlights because it starts pretty early. Um, You know, my first memories of of alcohol, my dad was a big drinker and uh, my uncle Paul. So my uncle Paul was my, uh, my mom's brother. And so when my dad and, and uncle Paul would get together, I noticed that things would just get really loud in the other room. And I was kind of curious about that. Of course, being five years old, I'm like, what's going on over there? Like, it sounds like loud, but they aren't like angry at each other. It seems pretty fun. So I would go in there and, and of course they would be like, Hey, Matt, come over here, you know, sneak a, sneak a sip of beer, you know, coconut or whatever it is. And I do the bitter beer face and they laugh. And so that was my, my first memory. I was, I guess that's quote unquote, my first drink, although I'll be at a sip, you know, and, and just kind of, Oh, how could you drink that? And, you know, it's the whole thing, but just the, you know, the attachment of, you know, the, the memory of like, it's exciting, it's loud, it's, it, there's entertainment value. Like, you know, I, I associated that with drinking, I believe from that, that very early foundational memory, you know, and then fast forward, uh, actually, there was one other childhood memory that I, I, you know, when looking back on my story, I I go, okay, that's something odd there for sure, which makes me wonder about like, you know, ancestral, you know, passing down of things is I remember I was playing house down in my basement when I was probably about maybe seven years old and I'm setting everything up and I had, you know, the cardboard boxes, like my, my house or whatever it is. And, uh, I remember like setting aside this one thing with a couple of bottles. I'm like, Hey, here's my liquor cabinet in here. And I'm like seven. And I'm looking back on, it, I'm like, that's kind of strange, kind of strange. Why would I, you know, pick up, picked up on that. So it's learned behavior, but also, you know, it's, uh, very much in my dad's side of the family, history of drinkers like his grandfather and and uh you know you know i believe his grandfather's uh so his dad's dad and you know like the even though women on that side of the family as well heavy drinkers irish right so very like stoic Mm -hmm. and very just like you know don't ask don't tell you know drink your drink your problems numb it you know that sort of uh, style of living right so very much uh was the case uh my mom's side a little bit more so like the closet drinkers like my nana was a 
like a, a closet wino, you know, that we kind of found out about later. Like she'd kind of sneak away and have a little, you know, little sip here and there. Um, you know, so it was definitely uh, very prominent growing up. And then I got into my parents got divorced when I was 14, 13. So I was going into high school, high school where I grew up in Prince George, British Columbia. High school was this grade eight to 12. So, you know, picture me, I pretty stunned with everything because it was a very sheltered childhood up to that point. And then it was just like, wow, starting to grow up very quickly. And so, you know, picture me going to high school, very small kid. I was shy. I hadn't hit my growth spurt yet. Kind of stunned because of everything that had my world had been rocked at home. So I'm kind of showing up into this place where there's these, you know, 18 year olds with mustaches. They look like adults and I'm just like this little punk kid. So definitely uh, a target for bullying. Cause I'm just kind of like, everybody's like, what's this guy's deal? Like he's not saying anything to anybody. He's small. Let's, let's pick on him. Right. So there was a bit of that. And I learned how to cope with, with bullying through humor, like self-depreciating humor, which is unfortunately something that I you know, uh, brought into my adulthood and kind of had to navigate my way out of, but this has roots in that, right? You, you either can't beat them, you join them sort of thing, right? Mm-hmm. So as, as a survival thing, I started doing that. So, you know, I, you know, I was always into sports and all that, but I remember by the time I was about 16 years old, I smoked my first, uh, my first a doobie, my first uh, marijuana. And um, uh, yeah, I felt very much like peer pressure. It didn't feel like me. I was very nervous about doing it. Uh, but then, you know, I met a guy that I was a little more comfortable hanging out with, and we started doing it on our own time, got into music at that point. So I very much pivoted a hard pivot from, uh, from exercise and from, uh, from, from, you know, the sporting teams at school into music. And that was sort of the gateway into the drinking after that. So it was like music. As soon as I started reading all the, you know, uh, the bios on like Led Zeppelin and all these like rock and roll lifestyle so I've, mm-hmm. I, I'm like a 16 year old influential, uh, as I am at that time, I'm like, I want, this sounds so cool. Like you have to like destroy a hotel room and, <laughs> you know, so like, I don't know at the time, it's especially when you're like kind of an angry teenager, I had a lot of angst in maybe it's because of, um, what was happening at school and at home, you know, I had a hard time expressing myself. So music was a great abstract way for me to express myself without, you know, having to verbalize it or get too emotional, if that makes sense. So mm-hmm. that was a big outlet for me. My brother, I, had, I have one older brother. He was two years older than me. So he started booting for me when he got of age. So, you know, I was by that point, I was, I would say by 16 or 17, I was like pretty much drinking every weekend or every other weekend. And by the time I was in grade 12, my mom had actually moved out. So she got, had to take a job about eight hours south of where we lived i got to stay in the house i grew up in until i graduated so there was a year that my brother and i lived in a house when i was 17 and 19 with no parents so wow. at the time i'm like oh that's this is really cool <laughs> Who does like, that? right yeah. yeah it was it was it was very nice of uh, both my parents like my you know my dad was sort of intermittently uh in our lives at the time he was living uh in a trailer uh, you know, kind of up, uh, upper college heights from where we were. So he was close by, he was always near and they trusted us, right. As far as, you know, my brother te- technically is an adult at that time, 19. So yeah, we got to, got to do that. Uh, but in the meantime, by the time I was 17, like I say, I was starting to cross some lines pretty, like, I remember I wrote my, my provincial exams drunk. Cause I'm like, I heard this thing, like, if you study drunk, then you got to write the provincial, you know, you, you got to write your exam drunk. So (laughs) I'm like, oh, that sounds like great logic. Okay, because I've been studying like with a buzz on. So I'll wake up tomorrow and have a couple of drinks before I go do my exam. Just nonsense, right? So some of these strange things, you know, looking back, but at the time they seemed quite logical. And, you know, I I, I had this this idea that it was like, you know, the self-destructive say cry for help was i don't know we kind of tied in with the musician identity and and all this so i was kind of just finding my own way and having a hard, basically what it came down to looking back on it is i was having a hard time addressing my feelings so i was doing my best to either numb them or avoid them you know what i mean and and so that's kind of where where the the uh, the, uh, the teenage years went and then so by the time i was in my early 20s i uh, moved out to a bigger city uh, i'm in edmonton now which is about 1.4 million or so yeah that's kind of when like it really daily drinker kind of started happening right it was just like in alberta which is where we live it's like liquor stores i swear are on every cor- street corner they're like mm. everywhere and i couldn't believe them. they're all open till 2 a.m i'm like what it wow and it's so cheap out here compared to like bc where i was from so just the availability of it and uh you know just the thrill of being out of my own for the first time and you know bigger city so i was adjusting to living in a bigger city and being kind of a 
like a small fish in a big pond as opposed to where I'd kind of come from. And so, yeah, a lot of adjusting and just the fact that, you know, when you're young, you, yeah, I don't know. It feels like a rite of passage, strangely enough, especially when you're, as being a guy, I felt there was like this need to just party all the time. Like it was just what you see on TV and like, you, you know, your older brothers, you kind of saw what they were doing two years before you. And I'm like, Oh, I guess that's just kind of what we do. Right. It was sort of accepted as part of the culture. So so yeah, that's kind of how I ended up doing it. Um, and it started turning on me really about like 25 where I, where I stopped drinking to have fun. I was really starting to drink to like cope. I had a really bad breakup with, uh, with my, uh, girlfriend I'd had about five years by that point. And, you know, when you're younger for me anyways, uh, you know, the first times that the first breakup is just like, Oh, I'm never going to recover from this. Like I felt it so painfully. I'm like, I I will never find another girl like her. And, you know, I just had a really tough time with it. And again, I just was not addressing my emotions. I was through music through, you know, the abstract way that I could, but I wasn't ever confronting or addressing these feelings. Right. I would always, well, I'd kind of like to point out, like if people have heard it too, like you didn't have, like your mother moved away, your parents were divorced, your father was intermittently in your life. So I think, yes, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Like people go to college and they go and they party and that's what you do, right? You join the frat, you join the sorority, you get drunk, you get hazed, all that stuff. So that's somewhat normal. But what is sticking out to me is that you didn't have that guidance or that person to kind of bump up against to say, Hey mom, Hey dad, you know, I'm dealing with this stuff. Like, can you listen? Like, what would you do? Like you didn't have that parental or be it that you had, I haven't heard you mention like, Hey, you went to church or you, somebody in another band was kind of a mentor. There, there wasn't that, you know, you were kind of growing up alone. It seemed like. True enough. And I want to say like, you know, to, to, with my mom and all that, like we were a hundred percent supportive of her moving away. There was, She had gone back to school at age 40, uh, which at the time, so, you know, think back in 94, you know, divorces were pretty uncommon, especially in a smaller, smaller center. And to go back to school at age 40, that was well before the whole like mature student thing. Like that was pretty, pretty Mm -hmm. ballsy, forget the phrase on my mom's part. So, and she wasn't able to find a job in Prince George. So we definitely supported her in her moving away. And we kept very close with her as as close as we could, but yeah, with, you know what there was, yeah, there was definitely an absence for sure of, of mentorship. Yeah. It's a good point. You know, looking back on it, like funny, you mentioned that, right. Looking back on it now. And for sure, like it's, um, there was always like people that would concernedly kind of put in like, Hey, you're good. I go, Oh, of course. You know, I'd always, as if I'm going to say otherwise. Right. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, part of me did want somebody to go, listen, you're not good. I'm going to help you with this. Right. So I was kind of in that, that limbo land, but yeah, no, it's a you know, good point for sure to, to bring that up. Um, you know, and then, so oh, another thing I should mention too, is like, I'd worked um, a job, like it's a, a supermarket chain here in Western Canada owned by Jim Pattison, one of the richer guys in, in Canada here. So it was a privately owned. So it had this really cool, like neighborhood community sort of feel to this. So that's where I grew up. Like I literally started when I was 16 and I quit like four months ago. So I have 23 <laughs> years. I literally grew up with this company. Like, so that was going on as well. And I, it's worth mentioning when I started at 16 years old, there was uh, instances of like a Christmas, like this is kind of still the wild west days, like 97 when I started, right? That's back in the day when there's like on a Christmas Eve, there's like a bottle of whiskey in the, in the deli cooler, right? Like, Hey Matt, come over here. And I'm like, I'm like, this is what happens in real life. I can't believe this. Right. And they're like, you know, some having, uh, you know, underage drinks at work, you know, and things of this nature. I'm not going to mention anybody, but you you get the idea. Right. And like I'd have or if I get called in, uh, like if I was covering a shift, somebody called in sick and I came in. I remember my uh, assistant bakery manager would just like have a have a joint and he put my front pocket like right there on the floor and be like, thanks for coming in. This is for afterwards. I'm like. I, this is unbelievable. I had no idea the real world, quote unquote, is like this. Mm. Me, you know, meanwhile, it's kind of, you know, that was, yeah, that, that grew out of the, so, you know, I, I brought that into call. I thought that was cool. Right. I thought I was like, oh, I'm fitting in. Right. So yeah, that was like the building blocks for what happened. And then, like I said, around 25 is when it really started turning, like the relationship I had, it was no longer this, you know, this thing was like giving me courage and like the liquid courage, right. The confidence, mm-hmm. it started having this like more of a depressed feel to it. And so, uh, you know, I ended up, um, which really should have been my, my wake up call and my rock bottom moment. I, I gave myself, uh, 
acute pancreatitis from over drinking. And I was in the hospital for three days and needed mm-hmm. like two or three IV bags to get me rehydrated. And I remember the whole time where I, when I was in there, I was like looking up at the roof and it's going, man, this is, I'm, I'm so thankful for this opportunity. I will never drink again. Like this is my wake up call, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, it, you know, within 24 hours of getting out, and I'm sure you can know where this is going. I, uh, you know, my brain started going, oh, hold on, oh, hold on. Maybe not forever. Like you were drinking rye, dark alcohol is worse for you. If you keep to vodka, that's clear. That'll be better for you. And beer. Nobody ever has problems with beer. That's what was going through my head. I'm like, you know what? I think you're right. Let's try beer. Let's have a beer. I, I've i never been a beer guy. Beer is harmless, right? It's only 5%. And that's literally what, so within 24 hours, I had a beer in my hand. And, you know, so it's like, you know, nonsense, right? But it's just like, that's what your brain does. Or that's what my brain does, I should say mm-hmm. anyways. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so I would just sort of navigate that for the next couple of years. I could always kind of feel when I was like edging my way up to where something potentially frightening would happen. And then I just, okay, I'm going to quit for the night. Right. And, um, you know, this whole time, probably I would say like from like when I identified in the story earlier with 25 on to about 30, the whole time in the background in my head, something was telling me, you got to stop this. You did no more. Like you have to deep dial this in. This is going to harm you or kill you. And I would just, you know, I would think on that in some mornings, right. When I'd have a hangover or whatnot, but then by the time at noon hits and I've had a couple glasses of water, I'm like, ah, I'm fine. And then like, I just silence that voice. I'm like, yeah, don't worry about it. I got it. I got it. Right. So, you know, those are the, the three words I always say. Those are my, my, my biggest mistake words. I got this. I would say this mm-hmm. to myself all the time. And that was my, what I said to myself when I had a relapse, you know, without jumping around a little bit, but So yeah, that was it. I ended up having, uh, I'm with my fiance Darcy. So we've been together 16 years, but there was a two year period where we, between uh, uh, late 2010 and early 2012, where we, uh, we were taking a break from each other. And, uh, you know, it was very painful, uh, just sort of not, uh, it wasn't planned. Well, we'll put it that way. And there was definitely some hard feelings. Uh, we gotten together pretty young. So, uh, you know, there was just, just some things came up and it definitely separated us, uh, fairly, fairly painfully. So I would identify that as my true rock bottom moment, uh, where it looked like we were going to get back together and something had happened. And, um, yeah, I had a really bad concussion too. I, a couple months before that I had actually fallen down a set of stairs because I decided to take up, uh, smoking cigarettes again after I'd quit a while. So anybody that's had cigarettes in their life and intermittently, uh, knows when you have that first cigarette after a while, you get the massive head rush. So and I was mm. like, I remember it was a great cup party in November, 2011. And I had this, this couple of drags of a cigarette and I was like, Oh, I could feel it coming on. I'm like, I'm just going to go downstairs for a bit guys and, and uh, quit, have a quick nap and I'll come back up. And I went down the stairs. All right. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, head yeah. first. And it was like concrete floor. And, and um, I don't even remember. All I remember is coming to, and people were all around me. I was standing up. I had blood streaming down my face. There was blood on the floor. And I kept saying, I didn't even know why I was saying it, but I'm like, I'm okay. It's fine, you guys. And like, that was just like how automatic it was. I wasn't even aware of what was going on. And I was just like, no, no, it's fine. I don't have to go to the hospital. Meanwhile, I'm like, what's even going on? What, what's, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm catching up with myself or I'm catching up with the moment of what's actually happening. And uh, so I had a really, really bad, I whacked my noodle pretty good. And, uh, you know, I, I recommend to anybody that has a concussion, don't continue drinking. So I had, I'd have like a beer or two and I'd just be like, uh, like a zombie. Right. It's very, there's like, yeah, after, after, you know, kind of reading about it, it's very dangerous and not, to, you sh- really shouldn't be doing it. Uh, and, but right. I, yeah, I well, t- I have hockey, I have, uh, boys who played hockey. We've had lots of experience with, with, uh, concussions, not that and I don't know anything about drinking with concussions, but we've had a lot of mm. experience and they are definitely, yeah. You knock your noodle that much or have somebody else knock it. Yeah. It right. takes some, uh, <laughs> there's definitely some trauma there yes. that you've got to get some, some healing, some rest and hydration and good nutrients, not the, um, you know, the nutrients of, yes. you know, of alcohol, the, uh, the empty so, nutrients. Yeah. yeah. It was definitely, yeah. Funny you mentioned, it was like the only thing I could do to get, like, I was still going to work at this time and everything, but when I come home, I would just have all the lights off, no music, nothing. I wouldn't watch anything. And this went on for months. Like I had probably two or three months of these, like I was popping, you know, six or eight um, Tylenols just to kind of keep the headache mm-hmm. at bay. And Well, that's one thing I was going to bring up. Like, is this is kind of like went for a while and 
um, I'm assuming that you were still able to work and you had friends and you did your music. Yeah. Like it didn't disrupt your life too much. Cause I think that's what I've heard on many stories that it gets to the point where it's so disruptive that you have to, like you hit, like you said, you mentioned rock bottom, like mm -hmm. you hit your rock bottom. Like you get to the point where that voice is really loud in your head saying, mm. you got to do something, you have to stop. So I know that your sobriety time has been fairly short compared to your life. I mean, what did it get to, to that point that you said, okay, I'm done. I'm done forever. Yeah. Um, it's really, I got really got to give it up. Like what did it, what did it take or what did you get to for that to happen a few years ago? For sure. Yeah. So it's a, I guess a, I'll do it in two parts. So like I, as I was kind of walking up to the, there's my cat. She likes to get involved on the podcast. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> her name is Trout. If she comes up. So the first one was in yeah, right after that whole, the concussion thing, the breakup with RC, that's when I was like, and yeah, to your point, absolutely. That's why I never viewed it as a problem is because I was always able to still, I was getting promoted at work right? I saw I was maintaining friendships. I was in three bands that were performing all, all around town, right? So nothing had really caught up with me that way. I bought a house when I was like 23 years old, like obviously like paying it off and yada, yada, but like the fact that, you know, you know what I mean? And uh, so there's a lot of these things that were pointing to the fact that like, I didn't have a problem like on the surface, right? And I prided myself on that. I'm like, nobody knew like how much I was actually drinking and all. I was like, I thought that was cool, right? At the time. So yeah, that, that first one, I ended up taking five weeks off work because I was like, man, I can't keep doing this. And I was like showing up to work. I, I had no condition to work at all whatsoever between the concussion and still drinking and probably drinking before work and so forth. And so I took some time off work. I was about halfway through that five weeks. I was still drinking every day and finally went to my first AA meeting. So I had my friend Brent who had been through uh, NA and AA, and we'd actually had a bit of a falling out over substances and, and rent money and various other things. And uh, he was uh, ahead of me on recovery. And I reached out to him. I'm like, dude, I, I got to try something. Can you come to an AA meeting with me? Because otherwise I would never have gone. I was far too scared. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so he said, of course, man. And he's like a really jovial guy and, and he would really turned his life around. So uh, he, I credit him a lot. As uh, you know, we've got to the parking lot and I was like, kind of the deal where I was like, okay, the parking lot's good. I'm like, you know, I think I'm good. Like, this is enough. And Brett's like, oh man, it's going to be great. We'll go in there together. And he gave me this big smile. I was like, okay, I trust you. And we went in there and like, he's like a quasi celebrity. Everybody's like high-fiving him. I'm like, whoa, this is not what I was expecting. And I sat down and the guy starts the, the first read. And I'll tell you, it was like nothing I've ever experienced. Like I felt a physical weight, like leave my shoulders. I hold my stress in my neck and my, my shoulders. And I actually felt a pre like presence, whatever it may have been, it leave. And I was like, Whoa, I kind of started tearing up a bit. And I don't even, it didn't matter what he was saying. It was just the vibe and the feeling of the room and just mm -hmm. realizing there is other people that are going through this, that have gone through this and you're not alone and you can just be yourself. It was like this, I could drop the persona. I could draw, and I'd never felt anything like it. And, you know, mm -hmm. that on the strength of that AA meeting, I continue to go to 80 AA meetings for, I would say eight or 10 months after that consistently, like, you know, four or five times a week kind of thing. And uh, yeah, that really mu very much springboarded me into what was about three years, three months of sobriety between 2012, 2015. Yeah. 2015. So, and uh, unfortunately what brought me off the uh, was, well, two things, my ego, of course, uh, was, uh, was uh, quite convinced I could do moderation at, uh, mm -hmm. at that point. And uh, I went, I was a groomsman at my drummer's wedding. And it was kind of one of those weddings where like everything coming at you was like alcoholic beverage. Even the coffee had some Kahlua. I'm like, come on, like why? But looking back on it, I was not as protective over my sobriety as I could have, should have, you know, could have, should have, right. Uh, that it could have been. And, uh, you know, I, I was very protective to who I was telling about that. And I didn't, I just, I didn't want to getting out. Right. So I was still somewhat shy about that. So a few people knew, but you know, you get far enough into the night and the people that know are already well on their way. And I've done enough of these, like, you know, I'm taking tequila shots and watering the plant behind me instead of taking it. Right. And then finally at the end of the night, I ended up having a, a shot of tequila and I grabbed a Corona. And I was about halfway through the Corona having a conversation with Greg, my bass player. And I felt that like familiar reward chemistry, whatever's going on in my brain. I was like, Whoa, okay. Like I kind of missed this actually. And I'm like, 
you know what? And that's why I was like, I think I got this. Like I can, you know, it's been three years. I think I've learned enough. I can do moderation. And uh, I proved conclusively I cannot do moderation. <laughs> right. I had a zero zero percent success rate as hard as I tried for the next several years. And, you know, so just uh, to, to make a long story shorter, the second stint of sobriety, which started in April 9th, 2019, was based on my father actually passed away uh, a couple of days before Christmas in 2018 at age 66, which to me is just so sad by this today's day. Like that's so young, you know, right. people are living, you know, far. And, you know, it was hundred percent was his lifestyle. He was still, he just retired and he had all these big plans for this, for his retirement, he's a big golfer, golfer, right. But his health had just been, you know, he took up smoking cigarettes again, uh, you know, and uh, he was always a living the rock and roll lifestyle and it caught mm -hmm. up to him, you know, and I, I truly believe that. And it was, a, uh, you know, so that was a big wake up call for me. And, uh, you know, it was on his way, on my way out to his celebration of life, actually, which was this April, April weekend. And it came out of what was a, a pretty sloppy party weekend where I did like all oh, everything, you know, cigarettes, cocaine, you know, uh, marijuana, uh, cheap beer. It was just gross. It was, it was just a gross. Uh, and uh, that was, I was like, man, well, like it was, that's what you need. I, I, I that's what I needed. Um, mm -hmm. and you hear like people like Tony Robbins talk about, you have to get really disturbed. You have to get like that, just sick of being sick. You need something like that to propel you. And cause I, I hadn't got to that stage of that, that rock bottom moment. Right. And that was definitely, and then knowing that I had to like shift gears and then go and be with family that I hadn't seen in years and be like, res pay respects to my dad, where there's like mixed feelings of that. My brother was coming with me, my brother and my dad hadn't talked in 11 years and never reconciled. So my brother had some like a lot of mixed emotions. We hadn't been back together, my brother and I back to our hometown in 20 years, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, I did not set the table well for myself to show up as hundred percent of myself. And I remember like getting about halfway out there. I have eight hours to kind of clean up my act because I woke up that next morning, just all like, here we go. And I had a beer, my last beer, right? And then, because I always have hair of the dog, right? So I have it ready mm -hmm. to go. I had two and I had the second one. I'm like, I, no, I can't do this. I remember just dumping it out and I then started driving. So I, I drove, I got about halfway. Uh, so Prince George is about eight hours west of Edmonton. And in between, almost to the kilometer, is a beautiful rocky, like the Canadian Rockies. It's a rocky mountain town called Jasper, one of my favorite places on earth. And I was driving through there and it was a bright blue sky day. And I should have been just really like, wow, what a moment. And like, you know, paying my respect, respects to my dad and all that. And I felt completely empty and like helpless and had like suicidal ideation and just like, what is going on? Why do I keep doing this? And then that's where I was like, okay. So why do I keep doing this? And I remember I picked up my, uh, my phone as a recorder and just started kind of recording some stuff. And I was like, mm. curious. Okay. So now I'm getting, I'm, I'm finally addressing some things. I'm letting it out for better or for worse. It's sounding pretty ugly, but at least I am articulating it. Right. And then it was this, there was like a shift. There was a shift in me. And as soon as I, I got out of Jasper and it was almost like, like literally the halfway point, it was, I did switch gears. And after that, I, uh, man, everything just worked out perfectly. I remember I had a beautiful time with my brother. We got to go around our like hometown, see like all the you know places that we grew up. And it was just like, and he was kind of, he's usually very, he's a very rigid. Yeah. Not, non emotional guy. And uh, he was getting kind of emotional and all that. And it was like, you know, like looking back, it was, it was cool. We had this really good moment. And um, you know, I was like, I, to me, it was like the anchoring thing was like to honor dad and to end that whole ancestral pattern of drinking yourself to either to death or breaking off relationships or leaving things that really shouldn't have been left the way they were, whatever it may be. I'm like, no, I can stop this. I have a choice to do that. And as soon as I kind of had that other anchoring statement, it really fired me up. And I was just like, perfect. That's what I need. So that point of like really disturbed, this is not how I want to live my life anchored with something that's like outside of me, bigger than me and put those things together. And it's like, boom, good to go. So since then I've been, you know, it's been three years and a month, I guess. So, yeah. yeah and that's uh, awesome. This one, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. And we've, yeah, I commend you for that. I mean, we have had many stories on this podcast of, and it's that power that we do have, but sometimes we don't realize it, that we can change those 
generational patterns. And sometimes we can get, and I say this because I've seen it in my own, you know, family with different, you know, people, the way, you know, the different men that these women have married and these patterns and things like that. And you're kind of like, you can be at the point of like, well, I guess it's always going to be this way. Or um, I went to a, you know, healing type of weekend where we talked, you know, kind of healed through those mother wounds, grandmother wounds, but the generational wounds. And that's what we talked about is that we have, it's good to notice that it was really cool. I'm going a little bit off, but it's, I think you can perhaps relate to this. We had, we were supposed to bring pictures of our mother and our grandmother with us. And, um, and we placed those all around the table at one of the, you know, exercises that we did, if you will, and just looked at that and then talked about like what Mm. we saw there. And it was, you know, for me, again, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, addictions and things like that, but what I saw was my mother. And I know people can't see this, but you can Mm. like my mother and my grandmother sitting like this arms crossed, like on a couch next to each other. They look so much alike, but they're both like that. My grandmother has a little bit of a smirk on her face, but otherwise total, like tight lipped and everything. And I'm like, see, that's the way they were. And that's the way like I, you know, it's like when I needed somebody to talk to when I was in college, actually, when I was going through my eating disorder, like that's what I had to, to call, you know, the people that were kind of closed off. And if I brought something up that was perhaps against the way, I mean, they were English, you know, so not the Mm. Irish and stoic, but the stoic English that you just don't talk about the bad things. right? Right. And they were like that. And I had that, like, you know, fear of judgment. If I called them or like, would my mom even listen to me? And she'd be like, well, why did you do that? And why are you feeling that? I'm like, instead of like, Hey, open arms, right? Like Mm. open arms, open spirit, like open, like whatever I'm here as your parent, you know, you can talk to me about anything. But as we went through that weekend, I'm like, yeah, that's what I want to break. I want to, you know, break that like being closed off, not sharing your feelings. I believe that's again, what led to my struggle in college is that I didn't feel like I could talk to anybody about that stuff that was happening. The friends wanted to drink, you know, I was raised super conservative Baptist home. And then I went away to a great, you know, small liberal arts school, but everybody wants to start drinking, right? It's the rite of passage. And then the boyfriend wants to start doing things that I wasn't comfortable with. And then my sister, Mm. you know, she's really smart. She's there ahead of me. And I don't feel like I'm doing as well. It's like all of that stuff was happening. Like, and I was living with a, you know, my roommate had this great relationship with her mother. She'd sit there on the phone and they'd laugh and giggle. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't even have that with my mom. So, mm. but anyway, back to this, the point of like, there are generational patterns that happen. We've seen that yes. again with addictions. We've seen that with behaviors, with marriages, with all of that. And the wonderful thing is that we can sit in this place like you have and said, you know what? I see it. I realize that. And you know what? I'm going to change it. Not mm. only for me, but what you're doing, Matt, is you're changing it for those generations to come. And right. if that's a really powerful thing. It's very humbling that we get that, but it's really cool that we get that opportunity to not only change it for us, but for your, if you decide to have children or your cousins or people that you watch or, you know, people that are in your family that are connected to you, you have the power to do that. And so it's pretty cool. Definitely. No, I I love when you were talking about like what you're doing that weekend. It's a funny mention. I just did a uh, course on ancestral healing. So the uh, mm-hmm. coaching program I went through is called Enlifted, and we did a, like a little side course, essentially, right, of, of ancestral healing. And it was yeah, really interesting. So I resonate with what you're saying. Yeah, like I had uh, my mom is a big gatekeeper of family history. So she's given me a few different photo albums. So over that six week period, I had these photo albums out, you know, and just like really like scanning exactly like going back, okay, on my dad's side of the family all the pictures and granted, you know, back in the forties, nobody really smiled. Like photos were so new. Everybody kind of, you know what I mean? I don't know if it's (laughs) one of those like wind up cameras that like nobody knows to smile or whatnot, but in any event, it's like what I got out of it. And what we all talked about as a group is like, it's, it's about like understanding your family. They want to be, I feel that there's these stories and we were, we're like airing out stories. It's like, I, I got to collaborate with my mom on it and talk about, okay, what was like, what was Gramps's life actually like growing up 
and whole oh, man hard like hard living right back in like the 20s and like world war two one and two and just like pretty crazy it's stuff you kind of take for granted about like how great you have it now and it just felt like i'm i'm spiritual i'm a very spiritual person especially now and i felt like it was there was this whole new connection i have with my ancestors about like and it's not about like honoring because then you're putting them up on a pedestal and it's not about judging because you didn't walk a mile in their shoes. They had a very, very different life. It's about understanding. And out of understanding, you can have whatever. There's like a forgiveness or just an unconditional, it's just showing up, right? Yeah, I mean, what I I did a course called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, MBSR. Oh. And um, it's a really cool course that you can go through too, or led by somebody who I met through uh, a podcast interview. And that's something that really helped her during her, while her daughter was struggling with anorexia and she, but what, what came up with that, when you mentioned that it's like, there's a point where we talk about noticing, mm. like it's, you know, it's that realization. It's the noticing, it's the noticing of the patterns or the noticing of the behaviors or whatever. Yeah. And what she said, when you notice, then it gives you the opportunity to choose. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So you can choose to judge or you can choose to forgive, or you can choose to move on or whatever, but it's just that chance that that slowing down enough quieting enough to notice okay this is going on this is how i feel somebody sent me a message this morning some a colleague in my business and we were talking about some different things and she's writing her book and we were talking about some things and it just like i was like wow man i felt that in my heart like i love what i get to do for instance with my wellness business and the growth of that and i like to do it so that i can help people make healthier choices and make a change in their life but it really hit me when we were talking about things. I was like, you know what? And as I continue to do that, it gives me a larger platform to talk about, mm. like you said, spirituality, mental mental wellness, physical wellness, spiritual wellness. And that like hit me. I felt that. I was like, wow, mm. I noticed that. Like, wow, that's really, maybe that's that another layer down of about that why. But anyway, I'm yeah. getting, I'm going off. But it's like that idea of noticing like noticing and bringing it up and just sitting there and saying, because perhaps you had this, like, like when I had fe emotions or things were happening, mm. like I wasn't, I guess, really given permission to, you know, if I noticed it, I wasn't really given permission, if you will, to just kind of like, yeah, what does that feel like? It was kind of For like, sure. okay, we didn't talk about it. Yep. Or like, just yep. move on, move on to the next thing, move on to the next yeah. thing. Don't sit there. But there's yeah. a lot of power in like feeling our emotions. You talk about on yeah. your site and with the, you know, the, the power of taking a rest. And yes. again, it's like that slowing down part. We're just go, 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 go. And kind of like you said, with your story, you just kind of get caught up with life and this is what you did. And this is what you're introduced to. So we just kept going and going, but yeah. when we can sometimes slow down enough to notice again, I just think that's really powerful. When we notice, then we get the ability to choose. That. I love that. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. That's, I love getting like, yeah, I love what you're doing. Like excellent work. I, your site is amazing. Like everything you got going on is awesome. So uh, you know, kudos to you. Yeah. And I like what you're talking about, like getting like layer after layer, like, and that's what it is. It's this discovery period. And it's like, that's, that's the mindset I'm taking into the work that I'm doing is, is this good? And like, I'm feel like I'm always going to be learning as well. And then the best way to integrate what you learn is to then teach it right it's like mm -hmm. they say it's like you you remember 80 percent of what you teach right so you can it's like 30 percent of what you write or what you listen or how you if you hear something 50 percent if you write it down it's 80 percent if you teach it so mm -hmm. if you can get to the stage where you can then turn around and help somebody with it man does it ever help you and, and it's a you know so it's a it's you know double double win at that point but yeah one of the things you were saying as far as um you know like slowing down and all that and that's what I was on a podcast, I think last week, and they'd asked me, what was the difference between, uh, you know, 2012 to 2015, that first three years versus this three years. And honestly, it took me a minute. I'm like, obviously there's some nuances and I'm like, I'm a different person and yada, yada, but okay, what's the core difference? And that's what it was, was, was the taking the time, the more yin energy, right? Like the taking the time to, to be more mindful, right? I I'm so caught up in i've always been caught up in like doer achiever energy right crossing off a to-do list okay what's next and um and coupling that with uh, what i was missing from the first time was like a feeling of like a reckless 
release for that. And now finding it's, it's funny now knowing uh, I'm a little bit older, a little bit more mature that the energy that I thought I needed that I was missing was in fact, like the opposite kind of energy. What I mean by that, instead of like needing this adrenaline dump and going out at 2 AM to a, a liquor store and, you know, doing this and that, I've actually found a way to temper that energy by doing the exact opposite style of energy through meditation and breath work. And mm. I've, I've fulfilled that itch that I've always had in my body by going with the opposite, opposite energy, if that makes sense. So that was, that was very much what, um, what changed this time around. And so I don't have a, you know, before I was like, wow, do I need to take up skydiving? Do I need to get like get in a fight club. What do I need to do here? Right. And it's, it's not that it's the, it's the opposite. I would, the one thing that I was always overlooking, it was in my periphery. I always wanted to get into this, into meditation, but it was like, well, I don't have time, but now it's like, well, I'm going to meditate and then the rest of my day is going to go smoother and then I'll have more time. Right. It's like, it's just shifting and trying it on. Like it's, it's different things for different people. Right. It's a practice. That's why they say meditation practice, which I like that, you know, so that, that was the big, that was a big change. So that definitely yeah. uh, resonates as well. Well, and that's what you said, like, try it on. That's what I, I remember coming home from a, a yoga retreat in Austin that I, a girlfriend of mine that had really introduced me to yoga up here um, in the Midwest, she had moved to Austin, unfortunately, still a little mm. angry about that because, I mean, I love yeah. her, but it's like, she's such an awesome friend and an awesome teacher. And so we went there and I remember coming home and I was at the airport, either at Austin airport or coming in through Midway. I don't know. But this guy was talking about, you know, I think I had, I had something that distinguished, I think I had my yoga mat with me or something like that. And so she, he started to interact with me and, Hey, where are you coming from or whatever? And I said, yeah, our yoga retreat. He looks at me I'm like, yeah. Yeah, my wife says I should do yoga, but I don't know. I go, you ought to try it. It'll change your life, you know, but it's, it's that like, you got to try it because it is kind of like, I love what you said. It is kind of the complete opposite mm. of like, sometimes what we like, I was a runner. I mean, it's like, let, I'm just going to go for a run. I'm going to go and do a boxing class and stuff like that. Now, albeit that can be helpful and like go for a swim. So I can think there, but I think sometimes for people, cause I've had it myself, like sometimes it's scary to sit and to yeah. be quiet yeah. because like all of that stuff comes in your head and then you, what are you supposed to do with that? And I've seen that with our daughter, like, okay, but if I keep going, then I don't have to think about that stuff that comes up when I do uh, slow down. Yeah. You know? So part of the reason I use guided meditations, like through different you know, sites and apps and stuff, I think is just so that I have that. Cause sometimes it's just too much monkey mind. So I need somebody yes. to be telling me, what are you supposed to think about? <laughs> what am I supposed yeah. to do? Again, what are you supposed to breathe? Where am I supposed to tap? Yes. All of that kind of stuff. Even though I've been doing it for years, there's some days and that's what I hope people hear on this. Like if you need a little bit of help, like reach out to somebody like a coach yeah. like you or get yep. an, onto an app or go to YouTube. Like there's so much that you can find beginner breath work, beginner meditation, you can find it and just, um, you know, try it on for size. I like what you said there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. No. And great points all around. Like one of the, uh, the apps that I would highlight and you, yeah, like you say, YouTube, you can find anything. There's some great free yoga programs on there. Like yoga with Adrian is amazing. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, She's awesome. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And uh, I love her dog that always comes on. And uh, yeah. Benji, I think, and and there's just like uh, sound therapy tracks on there. It's all free, right? And, and then you can figure out what, like, sort of what your personal taste is with it. It's like anything else, right? Like, uh, you know, like meals or like uh, otherwise music or movies. You'll find your personal taste, and mm -hmm. then from there you can sort of expand out on it. It's a whole other world when you get into it. It's a uh, picture it as a more of an adventure of like self discovery as opposed to something that's intimidating, right? It's fun. There's a uh, you know mm -hmm. and. I, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's so funny. eh? like, it's, it's almost like too much of one thing. Like, I like what you're saying. You're going like, for sure. I was like the jogger. I was working out. That was the first thing that I substituted the energy of my addiction with was going to the gym. And I was just again, but that's, that's that same kind of energy. That's that doer energy. That's mm -hmm. okay. I'm not going to think about this because right now I'm like on the, I'm doing some weights. Like it helps you. It does of course help you process it. Don't get me wrong. Like I still, I do daily exercise, mm -hmm. but like what, what you touched on there hundred percent is like when things would come up for me, I would distract myself. I would, uh, just grab my phone. Oh, oh, I'm starting to kind of feel that weird feeling in the pit of my stomach, like loneliness or whatever it may be. Oh, you know what? That's okay. I'll, I'll just check my text messages. You know, it's like avoidance. It's like distraction as an, an avoidance mm -hmm. method. 
a hundred percent. And like, I still do it. That's still something I'm working on. Sure. But at least, like to your point where you're saying notice awareness, I'm now aware of it. So now I'm kind of like, I, I view it as like, it's like that whack-a-mole game. I know certain things that, okay, I've got this one. And all of a sudden it's like, boop, well, you forgot about this. That you're, you're still doing this behavior and it takes shape over here as well. I'm like, damn, you know, so it's, it's constantly, you're, you you got to be a very, uh, you know, and that, you know, that's just, that's part of life though, too. You got to mm-hmm. recognize that, uh, it shows up a different way. Yeah. And you said, you know, you're, you're still learning. You're going to always learn. And I've said on this podcast before, like we become a couple of things, we become experts by experience. So, you know, even if you haven't gone through specific training for this, that, or the other, like you're an expert on this sobriety thing because you've lived the life. I'm an expert on eating disorders to a certain extent because of my experience, my experience with my daughter. And like I tell my my clients and my friends and others, it's like I'm just farther. I'm not like a big expert. Like I don't I don't know everything, right? Right. But I'm just farther along on the journey than perhaps you are. Totally. And so I'm just putting my hand back to say, hey, I'll I'll teach you what you know. Come on, let's talk together. Let's you know I'll come beside you and share what I know. Um, perhaps that might help you because. When you say, oh, yeah, I've been through that. Yep, I've had that experience. So we're just, yeah. again, sharing what we've been through to teach others that are perhaps just not as long, far enough along that path, you know, as we are. For sure. I Absolutely. I found some of my best coaches or mentors right now are exactly that. They're like two years ahead of me. And then, so they're still very much in touch with what I'm going through. And they're like, ah, yes, I remember this as opposed to some, don't get me wrong. There's something to be said for somebody that's got 20 years experience as well. Sure. That's up there, but yeah, absolutely. Fantastic point. And that's kind of the stage that I feel I'm at. I'm, you know, three years in, whereas like some of the people I've had on my show are 30 years in, but honestly, like at the end of the day, there's like, they, they're still human as well. They have these recurring things throughout the 30 years that I'm having in three years. There's people that are three days in, right? So we're mm-hmm. all at different stages of it. And I love, I love what you're saying. It's like, yeah, you're just a couple kilometers up the way and mm-hmm. Hey, I'll, I'll stay here. I'll wait for you. We'll do the next leg of this journey together. Uh, you know, and, and I can, I can let you know what I've been through and, and yeah, there's something very empowering about finding somebody that, I, I found it, especially in this field, I'm not sure how it was for, for like the eating disorder and such, but where you kind of have this really shameful energy about something and then you, it sneaks out of your mouth. You tell the story. Somebody's like, oh man, you think that's bad? That was my Tuesday morning. Like I've done that <laughs> right. like five times a week. I'm like, oh, and you kind of have this moment. You can have this release of like laughter and you're like, the shame converts into laughter and you're like, oh crap. Okay. Now I don't feel so bad. Right. And there's just mm-hmm. like something so like connecting about that. And I I love that about, about this work. Well, yeah. And I think that that's the power of support groups, be it the 12 step programs or the whatever. Um, I mean, my daughter almost religiously every morning, eight o'clock here, she clicks into one online Nice. and I hear she's downstairs having her breakfast or walking around or whatever. And I hear that it's that commonality, like you said, of the people that have gone, that are going through it, going through the stuff. I mean, I found that with Al-Anon when I decided to step into an Al-Anon meeting, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, all this stuff is going on in my life. And someone said, go to Al-Anon. Mm. Yeah. You have that, like, okay, I feel like I'm not alone. And like you yeah. said, that first, that first meeting that you went to, it's like that weight comes off and you're like, yeah. oh, I get it. And you feel, you feel safe there. So I hope people hear that of like, just finding what works for you, but don't, cause some, I've heard people say, oh, you know, those 12 steps, like they just go to that and they perpetuate their, perpetuate their disorder and their diseases. Cause they just keep talking about it. I'm like, well, maybe some, but you know, the vast majority, there is that support, comfort, safety of like, cause you know, I mean, if you've been to a 12 step, there's no, like, there's no cross talking. You just share your yeah. story, you share your yep. shit. And then like the next person, and then, I don't know, I've sat in enough meetings going, okay, I needed to hear that. I needed mm. to hear that. I needed to hear that. Right. You know, you go yes. there and you hear the stuff that you need to hear. Yep. And somebody says the same thing about what you said and you go home and you feel a whole lot better. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's great way of looking at it. That, one thing that I, what I think of with the meetings is like, I, 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 I last month or so I've been asking people because everybody says, well, what's your authentic? Like, what's your truth? I'm like, well, what is authenticity to you? Cause it gets, this word gets thrown out a lot. Right. And there's a, one of my mentors had mentioned it uh, more so of the context of 
what, what you need to be able to be authentic. And I view, I view that to be as very much in these support groups. It's like safety. As soon as like, that's what I was saying in that AA meeting. As soon as I realized I could drop the persona, I didn't have to have like certain parts of my personality tweaked or turned up. My ego didn't have to filter what I was saying. And I could just speak from the heart. In fact, it was encouraged. And that's the whole purpose of being there. Damn, there you go. That's authenticity. It's the context of like yeah, safety and the that these support groups provide and like you say it's no bs it's just like hey like we're doing a check-in speak from your heart and mm. do some gut talk here so like I, I really like that i'm like so didn't necessarily he kind of skirted what his definition of authenticity is but the, the context of which can you know you can be authentic mm -hmm. he painted such a beautiful you know picture or quote of it so i'd like to share that as well yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, I feel like we could talk for the rest of the afternoon here, but uh, for yeah. the sake of uh, both of our times, our schedules, we're going to yeah. um, wrap it up. And again, I know, I mean, we've got lots to talk about. I'm uh, hoping that I can, you know, as I shared, I'd love to share on your podcast again, just Absolutely. to help other, yeah. you know, and continue the conversation. But yeah, um, I know that you're doing some coaching, you do some great things on social. So tell the audience where they can, where they can find you. And again, what you do offer to those that you help. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on the show again, Moira. And absolutely, mm -hmm. we'll have uh, have you on my show. I'll send you a link after this. So yeah, you can find me at uh, my my main website is recoveryroadmap.me. So that's all just one one word, all lowercase, dot me. And that is my same, uh, it's the same as my Instagram handle. So you can find me at recoveryroadmap.me. And then my name, my picture will show up. It's very easy to find. So I'm on there a fair bit. If you, if you want to follow me and give me a direct message on there, very easy to get a hold of me that way. Uh, I also do, uh, it's a Facebook page called Matt Gardner Live, and that's all one word. And so that uh, shares, I do a couple different, like I have a life coach podcast with a friend of mine. And then I also do Beyond Recovery on there, which is my uh, recovery podcast, obviously. And then my sound therapy. So it's all kind of like a, like an umbrella for all, all the different things I do is the Matt Gardner Live thing. So yeah, and other than that, I do some uh, some sound sound therapy, and I'm getting into the guided breath work and uh, guided meditation tracks as well. So that'll be uh, that's coming soon. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, definitely, is, if you give me a follow on Instagram and all that, you will be able to um, to kind of keep tabs on all of that. And I'd love to hear from you, so uh, please reach out. Yeah, and I love the fact that you were a musician, you know, and have a love there, and now you're working with the sound therapy and and uh, yeah. stuff like that. So I think all uh, always loving the music, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, continues, continues on. So, um, you know, as we wrap up today, you know, any last words for the listeners that, um, you can provide or things that perhaps you didn't share, you want to kind of reemphasize just as a close up for today? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, at the end of the day, like if you're sober curious or you're just starting out, or if you're five years in, whatever it may be, you know, it's, it's, it's so important to, to remain connected first off and, and just have some humor about it as well. So it's like, for me, the discovery and the healing that I've done is, is providing a safe spot, a connected spot to bring those emotions up and to be able to actually address them. Cause I spent my entire life running away from them, avoiding them, numbing them. So if you can get to a spot that you're, yeah, you're feeling, always feeling connected with yourself and with other people. So finding a community and then having some humor about it, because as we'd mentioned, the best way to get rid of some of the shame energy and some of the other stuff is to flip it and get some humor involved. And that's where you can get out of a really good community as well. So highly, highly recommend it. Don't do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't feel the need to white knuckle. There's a time and place for willpower, but willpower is only one small component of it. At the end of the day, a community is going to get you through it. So find some folks that can help you with that. At that point, it kind of turns to from an ordeal into an adventure. So that would be my uh, my closing statement. That's good. That's good. Yeah, so good, Matt. Yeah, thanks so much for all of that. And again, thanks Thank for you. connecting. I know you originally reached out to me, and I'm so glad that you did. Um, Thank you. Again, this is what I love to do is connect with others and sh share their stories and see how we can help each other. So thanks for um, everything you shared today. And um, to all my listeners, thanks for coming back and listening. As I always say, share these podcasts with others so that they can hear the stories so that they can have a better tomorrow than today. So thanks, Matt. Thank you. We'll talk to you all next time. Thanks for listening. If you like this podcast, head over to iTunes and leave me a five-star review. Share it with others and make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a thing. I've got a tribe over on Facebook, so head over there. 
and search for Juggling the Chaos of Recovery Podcast Tribe. And do you know somebody who has a story, a story to share, a story of recovery and hope? Please let me know, as I'd love to feature them as a guest on one of these next upcoming podcasts. And perhaps you're looking for a community of like-minded, collaborative, and supportive people who cheer each other on as we strive to improve our lives. If that sounds like something you've been looking for, schedule some time with me. You'll find the links in the show notes. Let's talk, and let me help you find your way. And I'm here to tell you that you're worth it.